are. So again, this is Crystal and I have Carrie and Lee with me here. Um, we are going to go through a couple things to orient everyone to the Adobe Connect webinar room and then we'll get started um, with a presentation from Sarah and Mary from ICF about the evaluation of the project. So uh, the first thing I wanted to ask if everyone can um, use the chat window, which is on the bottom right, to let us know what agency you represent. Um, so you can just start typing into that. You have the option to chat everyone, which is what, I'll hope, what I hope you'll do now. Um, you can also chat individuals if you needed to or wanted to during the webinar. You can do that. So if you don't mind, please chat the organization that you're from. Thank you so much. The other thing I wanted to take note of is at the top right of your screen, you'll see a little person, start, yeah, kind of the right, sort of the middle actually. You'll see a little person putting their hand up. And if you click on the down arrow for that, you'll see several options come up. And you can use this to give us feedback like applause, which we appreciate, but also to tell us to slow down or that you can't hear. And you can use the chat window as well because we are monitoring that. But we will be using the raise your hand function. Um, if you have questions during the webinar, um, please raise your hand and we can unmute your line in order to answer those questions. The other thing I wanted to note is some folks joined as guests. And if you could, we'd really like to have everyone's name entered into our system. So um, what you'll need to do for that is click on the list icon at the top of the attendees tab. That'll be right uh, on the right side of your screen, the attendees tab. And there's a down, is there a down arrow? Yeah, so there's a little um, icon with lines in it and a drop down arrow. And then you'll click edit my info and there you'll be able to enter your name. So that'll really help us out if you can do that as well. At the end of the webinar, we're going to be asking some poll questions. We really appreciate if you could respond to those questions. They'll come up on your screen and you'll just click an answer and then we'll um, release the questions. There's five questions, so we'll release them one at a time and you'll just need to, to make a quick, quick selection and um, then we'll close out the webinar. And with that, uh, I will turn it over to um, Sarah. Great. Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be here today and have the opportunity to talk about the evaluation with all of you. Um, this shows our agenda. We're going to start with OBC, who's going to welcome us. Then NIJ is going to do an introduction to the evaluation. And then I'm going to come back and I'll be talking about um, how we fit in within all the project roles. I'll be giving an overview of the national evaluation. I will share the logic model that we've developed. And then I'm going to talk in detail about each of the data collection components. Um, so we will, just to give everyone an idea of what is coming ahead, and I will turn it over to Bethany. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Bethany Case from OVC, and I'm also joined by my colleague, Lindsay Waldrup. Um, thank you all for joining. So exciting that we're actually really getting a few of these webinars under our belt. Um, I just wanted to um, convey again how excited OVC is about this program, how important we think that these, um, that this entire program is, the two state level demonstration sites, the evaluation, as well as the training and technical assistance component. We see all of these interrelated parts as working together for um, a much greater purpose and to really help show us um, what needs to happen to, uh, to really raise the bar for services to children and families who have experienced violence and victimization. So just to remind you all, maybe you remember, maybe not, I'm sure that you do though, uh, whenever you applied for this grant, um, gosh, it's been about a year, year ago this time, uh, you probably remember reading in the solicitation or RFP a little bit about a, um, 
an evaluation, an NIJ-funded evaluation of these efforts. And the reason that OVC and NIJ are working together um, to build out this evaluation component is because, because we really have an opportunity here to, um, to measure what's, what's happening and to be able to hopefully illustrate or demonstrate um, that, that some of this stuff is working. And so anytime that we have an opportunity to have an evaluation component funded through NIJ, we jump on that because that really, um, it really can provide the opportunity to show that these types of efforts can work. So you're part of a very important larger effort and uh, everything that you're doing is, is all kind of for the greater good. And so we're really eager today to learn more about what this NIJ funded evaluation component, uh, what to expect, but also what it's, uh, what it's going to do for our program and for advocating for kids and families uh, moving forward. So Sarah, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and I will then turn it over to Dara. <laughs> OK, great. Hi, everyone. Um, Again, uh, like Bethany, I'm very excited to be here and to um, you know see things starting to happen with this project. Um, I just um, wanted to take a minute or two um, to give you a little bit of background and context because I'm not sure um, how familiar, um, if at all, you um, you may be with with NIJ and, and sort of what we are and who we do. And um, you know, I thought that that would be a helpful kind of framework um, before jumping into the details of the evaluation. So. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, um, the National Institute of Justice is the research, development, and evalu evaluation arm of the Department of Justice. And as such, our um, mission is to improve knowledge and understanding of crime and justice issues through science and to provide objective and independent knowledge and tools to reduce crime and promote justice, particularly at the state and local level. Um, and um, specifically, uh, we have uh, one of our focus areas we do a lot of work in. Um, is in children exposed to violence. And we have a portfolio of individual research projects, but more relevant um, to this work, obviously, is, as Bethany already alluded to, um, that we um, many times will collaborate um, not just with OVC, but also with other um, partners from the Office of Justice programs to evaluate large initiatives such as this one. And you know, I think, um, thank you, Bethany, for sort of introducing uh, this concept. But from our perspective as well, that the, um, these collaborations are really um, an important part of the work that we do. Um, we see it as a really um, unique opportunity to ensure that the best science is brought to bear on the services that are being provided to victims of crime. Um, but also that we can learn um, from all of the amazing work that, um, that you all are doing. And, and really, we see this as a um, kind of a continuous feedback loop where we're um, trying to learn as much as we can from these projects so that they can um, inform future uh, relevant work. Um, Sarah, you want to just move to the next slide? Great. Um, so again, just um, to sort of bring us back to this particular project, um, as has already been mentioned, um, OVC provided funds to NIJ to manage this national evaluation. And um, just as you all uh, applied competitively um, to be a part of this project, we also had a competitive solicitation. And ICF International um, was selected to conduct um, this particular study. And I just the last thing I want to mention um, before I turn it back to Sarah is that, as I mentioned, um, we do a number of uh, these kinds of projects. And I think two in particular that we've done recently, one still ongoing, one recently completed, that are going to be particularly relevant um, for this work. And I think we have a lot of uh, lessons learned um, that we can hopefully apply. So one is actually an ongoing um, collaboration with OVC that's focused on wraparound services for adults. Um, but ICF team, including Sarah, um, are part of that evaluation. And so I know there's um, a lot of similarities, certainly some differences, but some similarities and lessons learned that I think um, will be helpful to all of us um, from that project. And the other um, was funded um, or collaboration with our partners at the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, where NIJ recently completed um, an evaluation of the defending childhood demonstration sites. Um, as you may know, that was a large um, demonstration uh, project focused on preventing and ameliorating children's exposure to violence. And um, there's so much overlap with that particular project that we're actually planning a webinar in September, I believe, with the evaluation team from that project um, to speak to you all about some of the lessons learned um, from that that we think, um, we hope, will be useful to you as you're moving forward in your work. 
So that's really all that I had to say. My contact information is there, um, obviously, if you ever have any questions. But again, I'm really excited to be a part of this, and I'm going to turn it back to Sarah now. Thank you, Dara and Bethany. Um, that's great to hear from you both. Um, as I mentioned, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we fit in with everything else. And I know this is a very busy diagram here, but this was our attempt at trying to map out the structure of the whole project. And you can see at the top here, there's the Department of Justice, and then we have the, um, the two arms here. So on the left, there's the Office for Victims of Crime. And underneath them, there's the National Council, including their leadership team, their steering committee, and their individual site teams that are interacting directly with the sites. And then also underneath OBC in the middle are the two demonstration sites, Montana and Virginia. And I will say that um, I just showed this to the site this week, and so um, they are reviewing it right now, and so their structure may change a little bit depending on the feedback we get back, but this gives a general sense of that. And then on the right over here, um, we see National Institute of Justice, and then underneath them um, is the national evaluation. And so this has um, ICF, our leadership team and research team, um, as well as our individual site liaisons that are interfacing most with the sites, and then we have an advisory panel as well. So you can see all the different entities here. Um, there are certainly a lot of players in the project, um, and hopefully this can be helpful for keeping everyone straight. In terms of the evaluation, um, as mentioned, it's funded by the National Institute of Justice, and we were really hoping that this study will help provide useful information back to the grantees and to OBC to inform the implementation. We also want it to be available for the field, for others who are wanting to replicate and um, do things in their own communities to respond to child victimization. And then finally, we're hoping it can just generally build knowledge to learn how system of care approaches may better lead to or may lead to better outcomes uh, for this population. And so there, I'm going to lay out for you all the different pieces of it. Um, but just keeping in mind kind of these three purposes and where we're hoping the information will go. The structure of this project uh, matches and mirrors um, the rest of you who are also funded under the project. So we have a 15-month phase one, and for this part, this is when we're really getting to learn about the projects, getting to know the people involved, um, tracking the different activities um, that the projects have. Uh, going on during their first phase, and then also working on the baseline study so we can understand what the landscape of services are before implementing a new systems of care approach. And then following that, um, we have the phase two, which is contingent on additional funding, and this phase would then be implementation documentation, um, you know, measuring fidelity to the interventions, and doing the larger impact evaluation to understand what are the outcomes of this demonstration program. In terms of our team, hopefully some of us are starting to become more familiar to you all. Um, Mary Spooner and myself are the co-principal investigators for the project. Um, and then we have Melanie Johnson, who is a site liaison for Montana, and Janine Crossman, who's a site liaison for Virginia. And then in addition to that, we have um, other researchers who will be involved in data collection and analysis, um, as well as our advisory panel. And you all will start to get to know um, and see um, interactions with some of these people as we hit different parts of the study. This first diagram, um, I think we showed this on the first webinar as well, but this gives just an overarching view of the evaluation. And it has multiple tasks, so you see task one, ongoing communication and management, obviously going throughout our study. And then the circle here, this is phase one, and we have different quadrants for these other tasks. So task two is developing the methodology and instruments. Um, this has really been a lot of what we've been doing in the past few months. Task three is the baseline study and implementation documentation. Task four is actually an evaluation of the training and technical assistance process, and then task five is reporting and dissemination. So this is all phase one, as you can see in the center there. And then around the edge of the circle, we have this visual to show that 
throughout all these stages, um, you know, there will be this mutual communication, advising, and informing between the entities. So the grantees and partners, our team, um, OJP, including an IJ and OVC, and the council. And then all of this work from phase one will really help to lay the groundwork and inform the impact evaluation which would occur in phase two. This slide shows the logic model that we've developed for the project. Um, and I'm going to walk through this kind of slowly because I'm not sure um, how familiar everyone is with logic models. But basically, a logic model is a diagram that lays out all the components of a program or a project. And it can be a really useful tool for understanding what types of things we need to measure on our end. And so you can see here at the top, it shows the goal in the orange box. Um, so this was uh, this is the established goal based on our conversations and review of materials uh, from OVC. So to improve responses to child victimization, by developing a consistent and coordinated approach to effectively identify, assess, and provide comprehensive services to youth victims and their families. And then below this, um, if you follow the arrow, these show um, different pieces of the program. So first we have inputs, and these are the things that go into a project. Um, in particular, things like resources um, or kind of what you're starting with. And for here, we have OVC funding and project officers. We have the grantees and their partners. We have um, the TTA provider. And then in terms of the evaluation, uh, the NIJ funding and project officer and our team as well. And then these inputs and resources are used to support project activities. And we've split up the project activities into three pieces here. Um, so for OVC, providing oversight and guidance to the sites, reviewing and approving plans for the TTA provider, providing the TTA and facilitating communication, and then for the sites, conducting the gap analysis needs assessment, growing and establishing their partner network, developing a new service delivery strategy, and then implementing that strategy. Um, and obviously, this is very high level. Um, there are many other activities involved for all these groups, but this particular logic model is really looking at the demonstration as a whole um, from more of the national level. So it's pretty big picture. And then all of these project activities are used to produce an output, which is a product or service coming out of the activities. And because, again, this is a very high-level logic model, we have the output as these replicable and sustainable statewide system of care frameworks. Um, and then that output or that product is expected to lead to certain outcomes and impacts. And we've divided these into short-term impacts and long-term impacts. So the short-term impacts are things like greater awareness of services, universal screening, improved coordination and more accessible services, um, just more increased delivery of services and improved satisfaction. And then the long-term impacts are really kind of the ultimate goal of what, you know, we all hope, you know, to see these projects achieve. So, which is, you know, reducing the unmet needs and then improving the well-being of uh, children and youth experiencing victimization. So that kind of shows you, you know, how we um, kind of disentangle the, proje the project and think about all the different pieces. <laughs> and then for each of these, you can see below, this helps us to start draw out what types of things do we need to measure for these. And these are just some example measures on the bottom. You can kind of think of them as, you know, a brainstorming. This certainly isn't comprehensive, and we may not uh, be able to get at all of these. But these are examples of the different types of things that we would want to measure for each of these pieces. So I do want to pause here. Uh, before I go into details about the evaluation and what those uh, components will look like, and I just want to see any questions so far about the logic model um, or kind of that high-level overview of the evaluation. And I'll put it back here so people can look and see. And I think we said if um, people have a question, if you click the 
raise your hand button, they'll unmute you. We have one person typing, so let's see if this is a question. <laughs> Glad to hear it, Nikki. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions, so I'm going to go ahead and keep going. But definitely um, at the end, we can come back to this if anyone has any other questions that arise later. Okay. So our evaluation uses a multi-pronged data collection approach. And the reason that we do this is because when you have some sort of intervention or policy change, um, a lot of times it can affect people differently. And so we're very interested in hearing, you know, from different types of stakeholders, how are they affected uh, by this project? And in addition to that, it can also be that certain changes are more visible to some people than others. And so by collecting data from multiple sources, it also gives us a better opportunity to actually measure change and capture some of the successes um, and, you know, really see it from all these different angles. So we have four primary sources um, of information or data that we're planning on using for this project. First, there are the project participants. And for this group, we have our network partner survey. We do stakeholder interviews and then also meeting observations. Then we're also interested in hearing from service providers generally in the field, so not necessarily the people that are most closely involved in the project, but just other service providers throughout the state. And so for them, we have a survey of direct service providers. Then we also want to hear from um, the child youth victim perspective. And so this would be a, da a data collection either from uh, child youth victims and or their caregivers and family members. And then finally, we have our administrative data component. And this is looking less at people's perceived um, kind of changes from the program or how they're perceiving services, but just some more objective measures of what's actually changing in terms of the services themselves. And I'm going to go through all of these pieces in more detail now. Um, the things on this slide are really geared towards helping us understand the project, um, understand who's involved, and really track and document the activities and milestones of the project. So we review materials. These could be things like proposals, project newsletters, um, you know, if there's new screening instruments developed, things like that. We also do interviews. Uh, first, we do an initial phone interview with the grantees, and we actually uh, just completed those this week, so that's very exciting. And then we're also going to be doing site visits where we'll come on, we'll do interviews again with grantees as well as uh, their partners to understand more about the project and get some of that rich qualitative information um, about, you know, what are the activities, what are the lessons learned, what are the strengths and challenges of the project, all those things that really help uh, are useful for others wanting to do similar things. Then we also um, are planning to do observations. So we would love when we're on site to uh, be able to observe some of the project meetings and see how those work. And then we also may try to do some observations of service delivery depending on how feasible that is with the site. Um, so we can see just how is that changing in practice. And then, of course, we have our monthly update calls, uh, which are really helpful for us to just stay in the loop in terms of what's going on with the projects and be able to track those big milestones. Next, we have the Network Partner Survey. And this is a survey where we're really trying to gather information about how the partnerships operate and how much service coordination and integration is occurring between the partners. This is an online survey that we'll be administering every summer. 
to all of the organizations that are directly involved with the project. And we do this every year so we can track changes over time and show how the services are becoming more coordinated if they are, um, you know, how collaboration is changing over the course of the project, those types of things. And this one's really fun because um, we create these really interesting visual diagrams that show um, the extent of service coordination and how the different partners are linked together. So this is one of our uh, really fun ones. Then we have our service provider survey. And whereas the network partner survey is really trying to get information from those that are intimately involved in the project, this is that survey that's looking at service providers throughout the state, the people that are directly interacting with clients to understand their perceptions of services for child and youth victims. Uh, this is also an online survey that we would be administering in two ways. Once um, immediately prior to implementation, that's our baseline measure. And then again, towards the very end of the project, after implementation um, has been in place for a while, it's matured, um, everyone's worked out the kinks, and um, we feel like that's a good time to measure um, kind of the final, the final stage of that. And this is surveying frontline direct service delivery staff um, and eligible organizations across the state. What that means may be different for the different sites depending on what their systems of care framework looks like for them. And it helps to measure changes in services due to the grant program from that service provider perspective. Then in parallel to this, we also want to do some form of data collection to gather um, the victim perspective. And this, this piece is still in development right now, um, but the purpose will be to collect information uh, from this population to understand how they're perceiving services and how those perceptions change before implementation to after implementation. Uh, so this could be surveys or interviews, we're not sure yet. It will most likely be administered in two ways. Um, you know, again, immediately prior to implementation and then at the end after implementation is considered mature. And this will be similarly measuring those changes in services uh, due to the grant, but from the victim perspective. And I'm seeing a question here. Um, so Nikki's asking, how will you determine the providers? And that is something that we will be working closely with the sites to understand, um, you know, who the system of care should be affecting, who should be involved in that. So for instance, if one site is really including educators, then that site might have educators, and if the other site doesn't, then we might not be looking um, you know, at educators. So it would be really dependent on how we see that evolving with the sites. And then we will be using um, a number of different resources to try to pull together that list. Um, we know some of the sites are already, you know, planning on surveying service providers as part of their gap analysis. So um, we may request to see if we can build off of that list. Um, we also, you know, know of other existing lists that are out there for these different population groups of service providers, and so we would look to those. We would do um, independent research on our part to try to identify additional organizations on top of that. So it's kind of a, a puzzle process, um, pulling things together from all different places to come up with that list. Um, and then Nikki's asking about systems of care in general or about this project. Um, to the extent possible, we'll really be trying to focus on the project, but that might be a little bit challenging if not everyone's aware of it. And so we may just be trying to get more generally at some of these issues of coordination and connection and seeing if it changes between the two time points. And then we can discuss at that point if we see a change um, you know, how much that might be due to this grant program versus other things going on at the state at the same time. Okay, 
So Lori's asking about um, the service provider survey and duplication with their survey and whether it's statewide. So ours would be statewide. And the timeline for this is still to be determined because it will be based on when um, the implementation is occurring, occurring for each site. Um, so I know that means different things for Montana and Virginia because both of you have statewide surveys that they're going out at different times. And this is definitely something um, Darren and I were actually just talking about this today, about really trying to be strategic about um, the timing of these so that we aren't overburdening people. Um, Myra's asking about IRB approval. We most definitely um, will be getting IRB approval. So we have IRB approval for um, most of our instruments and protocols at this point, and there are a few of the to be determined ones that will be going through IRB once we finalize development of those. I see one more question is coming. Lots of good questions here. So Nikki's asking about plans for distributing surveys in reservation lands. And this is something that we'll definitely need to talk through more with the site. Um, we want to build on you know, the lessons learned that everyone is learning through their process with their gap analysis and needs assessment. So we'll definitely be talking through as we get closer to some of those components we'll be wanting to talk very closely with the sites about you know, what they think will work in their sites, if they have any tips based on their experiences so far. OK. Um, let's see. Yes, Lori. So we would try to time these. Uh, sorry, Lori asked about the timing of these, um, and I do have a visual at the end that I think will help with this, but um, we try, we want to get this as close to before implementation as possible. Um, so depending on when that is for each site, you know, we would be hoping to field this, um, you know, anywhere from three to five months before that implementation point. The service provider survey, we can, would probably be shorter than the victim one. Um, I'm going to keep going. I know that um, the council is trying to work with some people. Um, sorry, one more here. Okay, so Gail is saying that Gail, are you saying that? we need to go through Virginia Department of Social Services IRB? Or are you saying you guys will have to go through it? I've unmuted you, Gail, if you want to just answer. Um, yes. Either the PI will have to submit the paperwork or the, the lead for the Virginia project. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some collaboration there, because you probably have more experience in completing the paperwork. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, all throughout this, we definitely want as much collaboration as possible. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll want to talk with everyone as we get closer to the, the stages where we would be surveying people outside of the project members. Uh, we would be talking very closely with the sites and really coming up with that strategy in a collaborative way. Okay, thank you. Um, Dara and Lori are saying they can't hear, and Monique, oh no. Hmm. I'm not sure what the issue can be. Okay. 
So I'm, I'm definitely going to pause here. I won't, I won't move forward until we get this resolved. I have unmuted a few people, so I think, Laura, you probably got a message that you were unmuted. Oh, but you can't hear me. Can people type in and say if they can hear? Okay, so Jeff can hear, and Nikki, Carleen, OVC. So we do have a number of people. I have to dial back in. Hmm. And Nikki, you said you're over your computer, but. And turn it on through your computer or dial back in. Hmm. Really sorry, everyone, for the <laughs> technical issues. Dara, you haven't missed anything um, once we started seeing people say, well, I, I guess I don't know when you stopped hearing, but as soon as we saw you couldn't hear and other people said they couldn't hear, we, we stopped at that point. I'm trying to resolve how many the audio. Oh, you can. Okay. So it sounds like dialing in is probably the best option for people who. Dialing in um, may be the best option. Uh, do you want to chat or respond the thing you can hear now over the Uh, she would be the project officer for uh, Virginia. The technical, yeah. She would be with um, either. Unmuted you yeah, I was just waiting for Sarah's response because I, I don't know at what point I, I might have gotten cut off, so I don't want to be repetitive, but I was going to try to provide an answer to it looks like, um, okay, so it looks like she did do that. Okay, I think I got cut out pretty early then because I saw a bunch of questions coming in about tribal sites as well as about additional IRBs, and I just, I didn't hear any response. I think that's when I got cut out, so I apologize. I didn't want to be repetitive, but I was going to speak to those but it looks like Sarah already did. Sarah, feel free to weigh in, though, um, if you want to chat more about it from an NIJ's perspective. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that I would add is, um, again, just to reiterate, so NIJ, we're a research agency. We, our grantees cannot do anything without multiple, multiple levels of IRB and human subjects approval. So in addition to getting an IRB from their institution and any other institutions that are required, so in this case, Certainly, we understand that there may be, um, you know, state agencies have their own IRBs, and, and obviously we're used to coordinating across a number of IRBs for um, a lot of the projects we work on. We also have an internal human subjects officer who reviews everything. Um, you know, I know some of you already have gone through OVC has a similar process. Ours, um, I think, is, 
is a little bit more intense given that we're a research agency and, and so we um, you know, focus a lot on these issues. Um, and, and as well, we have a whole program um, where we work on doing research in tribal communities and we have a lot of expertise there as well and so absolutely are sensitive to the concerns there. And in addition to working with you all at the sites, um, you know, we have some in-house expertise um, as well that we can bring to bear on making sure that we're um, you know, working in a way that is um, going to make sense for everyone involved. So I just wanted to um, assure folks that we're well aware of those issues and, and as Sarah has already um, mentioned, you know, we'll be working very closely with the sites as we develop those pieces of the evaluation. Thanks, Sarah. So I'm Think, not sure if Gail has a question. She, um, I unmuted her, so I wasn't sure. Um, so Gail, if you have a, a question, it looks like you should be able to just ask over your phone line. No, I had no questions, but uh, sorry, you were getting my sidebar conversation. So I'd appreciate it if you could mute me again. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, we didn't hear much of anything, so don't worry. <laughs> There we go. Okay. okay. Great. Um, well, these are fantastic questions, fantastic um, things to let us know about, um, like the state IRBs, um, bringing up issues um, you know, about tribal and the timing of the surveys. These are all really important things to, for all of us to be thinking about, and we certainly started conversations um, about some of these as well on our end and within IJ. But at this point, now that we're you know really starting to introduce everyone else to the plan, we'll we'll begin having more of those conversations with the sites as well. And um, I'm glad everyone's thinking about these things because they're they're definitely things we'll need to talk through. Um, okay, so then, as I mentioned, the child and youth data collection, this is one of the more complicated ones. This is um, definitely the most sensitive thing here. And so we are still working on developing this piece. And uh, we'll have more information about this down the line and, and definitely be having lots of conversations about this one. In terms of the administrative data, um, this is also a sensitive piece um, and complex. And so this one is also still in the works in terms of devising a strategy and plan for that, um, for a proposed approach to this. Um, the, the purpose of this is to have a more objective measure of services beyond the perceptual or self-reported data. We are hoping to get some sort of ongoing indicators for this. And this would allow us to measure changes in services across the course of the project and um, especially provide information about services between those two time points that we're getting for the service provider survey and the crime victim data or the, the um, child and youth victim uh, data collection. So lots more to talk about here. This one will absolutely need a lot of conversations and collaboration and thinking with the sites as well. We know there's a lot of uh, a lot of hurdles with this, um, and then those other pieces they're really about understanding and measuring things that the demonstration sites are doing. But we also have this component on the training and technical assistance piece, and the purpose of this is to provide ongoing feedback on the TTA delivered to the demonstration sites uh, by the camp, the council and their partners. And this is an online survey that will be administered quarterly. And it will be sent to any individuals who received TTA in that previous quarter. Um, and it's really to help us understand how resources like the TTA provider really help to support the demonstration as a whole. And then this is uh, the timeline I was talking about earlier that might be helpful. This is very conceptual. This will likely change. It certainly is not super exact, but it shows how these things fit together. And so if you look at this, the vertical black line, this is the implementation point. And 
Um, this was developed a couple months ago, and so we had estimated at that point that implementation would probably be in spring 2016. We realized that that may change. We realized that the two sites may have different implementation uh, stages, and so we would adapt as needed to that. But if you, if you look at this, you can kind of see there's pre-implementation and then there's post-implementation. Um, in the orange here at the top, you see there are some things that are ongoing throughout. So there's ongoing implementation documentation, um, including pre-implementation activities. Uh, cost data, the administrative client services data, and then the TTA feedback that would, would be trying to gather throughout. Then we have some things that are these two time points. So you see in the blue and purple below this, um, there's the first wave of the service provider survey and the first wave of the victim data collection. And then towards the right here, you see there's that second wave of both of those at the end of the project. And then along the bottom, these are these things that happen on a more routine basis throughout. So each summer, there's the annual network partner survey. This summer, there was also the initial grantee interviews, um, and which we've already done at this point. And then in the fall or winter, you know, we're we're going to kind of see how this works out timing wise with the sites this year. But this is around when we would be doing our annual site visits and observations. And so we would be um, visiting around the same time each year and talking with people involved in the project and um, really getting to know people and see how things are working on the ground. We also do um, annual mapping. So this is just a geographic map of where the partners are. And then we update that every year, depending on if there are new partners or partners have left. Um, things like that. So we can see how that looks geographically as well. Okay. And then in terms of what's coming up this year, um, right now we're focusing on reviewing information from the project materials um, and these first interviews. We're obviously going to continue participation in the monthly calls. That's really helpful for us. And then we are hoping next week um, to actually launch the Network Partner Survey and the TTA Feedback Survey. Um, we are putting these together so you'll kind of get them all at the same time. Again, only those who've actually received TTA will receive the, feed, the TTA Survey. And then the Network Partner Survey, this is the survey of the closely involved partners in the project. And then, because we don't want to completely inundate people all at once, we also have a data availability survey. Um, this will help us plan the administrative data piece. And this is a survey that um, will go out to the grantees and their close partners to find out what types of data they typically have, what is shareable and not shareable, what are some of the constraints around sharing. We want to get a good understanding of um, you know, what's, what's possible, what's feasible, um, what are issues there that we would need to work through with the site. So that can help inform our planning of the administrative plan. And then we would definitely come back. There would probably be a series of conversations about it afterwards. So that one we're going to hold off until August so we don't completely over-survey people. <laughs> and I promise um, it will get lighter after this. There's sort of an on slot right at the beginning, uh, but once we, you know, get that foundation, then it will be um, not all at once like it is right here. And then site visits, um, as mentioned, we're thinking probably late fall or winter, and very thrilled to come out and meet people in person um, and hear more about the project. And then at some point later on, there's this baseline data collection. That's the you know, state service providers and the victim piece. And this will be aligned with the site's um, implementation and expected beginning for that, which we're waiting to kind of see how everything progresses to start planning that. And as mentioned, we'll be wanting to have a lot of conversations uh, with the site to plan the best way to proceed on that. So hopefully this gives at least a good starter foundation for the evaluation um, what are some of the things we'll be doing? What are the, some of the things that 
uh, we'll be working with all of you on. And there will be lots more information coming um, after this, but this should provide kind of that overarching framework. So I will open it up for questions again. And this time I think um, if you want to raise your hand, we can unmute your phone and that might get us going a little quicker with questions. Um, so Jenna has already typed, a, or Gail and Jenna have typed questions. Um, so if you want to respond to those, and I'm going to unmute everyone. So if you don't want to talk, um, use the mute function on your own phone. But I'm going to mute, unmute everyone right now um, while Sarah takes care of those two questions that we have. Sure. Um, so Lori, I think your question was answered, but definitely let us know if you have a follow-up there. Um, Gail, you can absolutely have a copy of the PowerPoint. I'm happy to send those out, or the, the National Council may want to do that. I know that they've uh, been sharing some of those with the recording. Um, and then Jenna, so for the evaluation, we would not be gathering people for an all-site visit, but the, the National Council may be able to speak to that a little bit more about whether that's happening as part of other pieces of the project or OVC. Yeah, yeah, this is Crystal from the National Council. We're going to be doing an all site in the winter, um, which will cover this planning phase. And um, under phase two, we will also do an all site. Okay, great. Um, so Nikki is saying she's not sure if they're stakeholders or partners. Can you talk about some of the roles that partners might have? Um, and Nikki, it may be helpful for you to uh, talk and explain a, bit, a little bit more. But in terms, in terms of how we're thinking about partners, these are people that are helping plan the project. Um, and helping execute the project, helping um, you know with actual implementation, making sure it's occurring. It could include people that are delivering services themselves. It might include people that are not doing service delivery, but are there for more planning purposes or more um, you know engaging buy-in and things like that. So I'll start with that, and then maybe you can jump in if that doesn't fully answer your question. Okay. Were there were there other questions? I have a question. <clears throat> okay. Go ahead, Lord. And Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Okay, just making you. sure. Just making sure. This is Laurie Crawford from Virginia. I was just wanted to ask you, when you do the survey of the partners um, that's coming up fairly soon, is that something that comes from y'all through us um, that you already have set up with your explanation of who you are and what you're doing and um, why you're getting the information, that kind of thing? and then you just get us to forward it, or do we give you the information and you survey them directly? Um, so we, all the, the grantees will be getting an email today from Lisa Feely, who's one of our other researchers. And mm -hmm. she's, so she's emailing the grantees to say um, what kind of our plan thing is and let them know it's coming up next week and see if there are any concerns or requests to send it out a different way. But what our plan is, is to send it directly from us, and we have an explanation in it about um, who we are and what the evaluation is and, um, you know, related to the project and everything. And so that is our current plan. That way it doesn't burden the sites for you all having to send it out or deal with questions. You know, they can come directly to us. But in other studies in the past, I know we have had some grantees that they're concerned, you know, that partners won't understand or something like that. So sometimes they like to send 
a separate message beforehand or, um, you know, along with it or something like that. So um, Lisa's email, when she reaches out today, if it hasn't already gone out, um, definitely if you feel like you want to be involved in that dissemination in some way, that's great. We just want to make sure that they understand that um, it is separate, you know, it's confidential, um, and that's typically why we have it coming from us instead of the grantees themselves. Great. I just was curious because if I'm making contact with those same individuals tomorrow or before then, I would it would be good to kind of just give a heads up to expect something else. So. Oh, perfect. Yeah. That's helpful. And thank you. That, that would be great. <laughs> Other questions? I'm loving this. The last webinar I was on, there were just absolutely zero questions. So this is fantastic. Okay. Well, it sounds like that may be most people's questions for now. Um, Definitely, if anyone has anything they want to talk about separately or another question comes to you later, uh, please reach out. I'm happy to discuss and chat through. I know some of this stuff um, can be overwhelming, and hopefully I explained it in a good way for everyone else um, who may not be as familiar with some of the research practices, but very happy to talk through any of this in more depth with anyone and answer more questions. So um, I'll turn it back to the National Council. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. And I see um, Myra's typing something. So while she's typing, um, we are going to release our poll questions. Um, they'll appear on your screen, I believe, one at a time. Um, and these are going to be really helpful to us just to kind of understand the, the technical assistance we're providing and how it's fitting in with what you're doing. Um, and yeah, Myra, I think Sarah did say that the the Web, sorry, the PowerPoint will be available. We actually, the National Council has that, so we'll send that out um, to our team leads. We have just a few more questions. We're just trying to get them up on the screen, and it's just a little clunky to do so, but we appreciate everybody filling out the, the first uh, three. There's a, a new one up there now, if you can fill that out. Um,
I really appreciate everyone taking the time to do this. We might find a, a different way to do this in the future so that it's not so um, slow. But this is now the last question. Um, if you don't mind entering your answers, we'd really appreciate it. Well, um, thank you everyone so much for your time, and thank you, Sarah, for putting that together. I thought it was really informative and helped us to understand how we're all moving forward with the evaluation. And I believe our next webinar is going to be sometime in August, and we'll August 28th, and we're going to talk about running focus groups. Um, so I hope you'll be able to join us. And again, always feel free to send the link uh, beyond. Uh, to whomever you think would uh, benefit from it that's participating in this project. And um, if you have any questions in the interim, please give us, uh, let us know at the National Council. We're happy to help. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Talk soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.